let's get into the good stuff. Tonight's seminar is all about wahoo fishing. All about wahoo fishing. Who, by show of hands, has caught a wahoo? High speed trolling. Okay. I see a lot of hands are coming down when I say high speed trolling. Okay, I went from a lot of wahoo, you know, to not so many. This is an incredible tactic. It's really, really effective, and we're going to talk a lot about it, and we're going to talk a lot about the fish as well. We're going to talk about high-speed trolling for Wahoo locally here off our coast, and of course over in the Bahamas where the fishing is far better than it is here locally. First, let's talk a little bit about the fish, and please understand, by no means do I claim to be an expert angler, you know, or any better than anybody else. I've been, you know, fishing my entire life. I've learned a lot and I still learn every single time that I go out there. However, if something is working for you, stick with it and tell me about it as well because I want to continue to learn. What I'm going to share with you in, you know, 60 to 90 minutes, it's impossible to share a lifetime of experience in that brief period. But I'm going to share different tactics and a different mindset and different things that we do to achieve success when we're high speed wahoo trolling. Um, again, if something's working for you, stick with it and hopefully at the end of the night, you'll walk away with at least a couple of tidbits that are going to help you improve your game. Why are Wahoo so prized? Let's talk about that. First of all, one of the fastest fish, one of the fastest swimming fish in the ocean. This guy can swim 60 miles an hour. 60 miles an hour. So anybody who says, oh, how fast are you going to troll 20 miles an hour? That's too fast. You're not going to outrun this Wahoo. Okay, your boat is not going to outrun this wahoo. So don't think you're trolling too fast because you're not. It's an absolutely awesome predator. It's got incredible teeth and an incredible jaw. And those of you who have experienced it and really know this fish well, know how powerful they are. This fish, you know, thrives on not eating little sardines and little shrimp or anchovies. That's not what he's eating. Okay, tunas, bonitas, uh, skipjack, that's what they primarily feed on. And they will sever that fish in half in one bite. So imagine having the capability to charge in at 40, 50, 60 miles an hour and bite a 10, 15, even a larger tuna right in half in one bite. Okay, that takes incredible power. They're also one of the most glorious fish. And what I mean by that, when I say glorious, whoops, <laughs> that would have been funny. <laughs> Everybody loves catching wahoo. Okay, Everybody loves catching dolphin, loves catching sailfish, but wahoo, there's something really special about wahoo. I remember when I moved down to Florida many years ago, you know, I saw these guys catching these wahoos and man, I was just going crazy trying to catch these fish. I would go out here and try everything and you know how many wahoo I caught? None. Okay, at first, you know, none. I just couldn't get dialed in. Okay, I couldn't understand what they were doing that I wasn't doing. And it took me quite some time to really learn the nuances of this fishery and what works and why it works and how to, you know, implement the different strategies. But it's a, it's a really glamorous fish. Everybody gets super hyped up when they catch a wahoo. And remember that, you know, like I mentioned in all of my seminars, one fish, one, a fish like that, a 50 pound wahoo, can make the entire trip. Am I right or wrong? Okay, oh yeah. I don't care what you got in the boat or don't have in the boat, you, you land a 50 pound wahoo, high speed trolling, solid day, love it. Okay, I can't wait to go again tomorrow. So one fish can make all of the difference. And certainly we want to catch multiple fish, but first, you know, that first one is the hardest one to catch. And it's all about the details, you know, everything is about the details and you got to make sure you do it right because if you lose that one opportunity at that one fish, that can ruin the entire trip, okay? So we know that they're super fast, they're super glamorous, it's a very fast growing fish. There was a tagged wahoo that was recaptured and in 11 months that fish grew 22 pounds in 11 months. So very much like, do did you have a question? Yeah, what did it, did it go from like 527 or 50 to 72? It actually went from 11 to 33. 11 to 33. Okay. 
um, in 11 months, 11 pounds to 33 pounds. So it is a very fast growing fish, a 50 pounder, two years old, two to three years old, you know, fish that reach that triple digit mark, you know, like a lot of fish, they tend to grow rapidly for their first few years and then that growth rate slows down. But certainly all of the Wahoo that we catch are one, two, three years old, four years old is probably an absolute trophy. Okay, very, very fast growing fish. Absolutely delicious on the dinner table. Anybody know the finest, tastiest way to eat Wahoo? Sashimi. Sashimi, that's right. Absolutely raw. I see a face over there going, oh God, no way. Okay, absolutely. Raw is the best way to eat Wahoo. Far better than any tuna that you'll ever eat. Okay, really is just dip it into a little bit of soy sauce or, you know, ponzu sauce and you're going to have a treat that you'll never forget. So let's get into the high speed trolling. Why do we high speed troll for Wahoo? Here are the reasons. Number one, we want to eliminate bycatch. And when I go out there high speed trolling for Wahoo, I'm not high speed trolling for whatever eats my bait. It's not like when you're fishing planers with strip baits, because when you're fishing planers with strip baits, you're meat fishing. You could catch kingfish, blackfin tuna, dolphin, sailfish, the list goes on. When you're high speed trolling for Wahoo, you are in search of one species, of one fish, the Wahoo. Okay, so you're eliminating bycatch. That's first and foremost, you know, a, a really big benefit to high speed trolling. Number two, you're covering a lot of ground. Okay, Wahoo are not a dime a dozen. They're not everywhere all of the time. Am I right? If they were, none of us would be here. Okay, they're not. They're, they tend to stick to small areas that have optimal conditions. Well, to find these fish, you've got to cover a lot of ground. So high speed trolling allows us to do that. And what is the definition of high speed trolling? Well, we know when we're fishing for dolphin or when we're trolling ballyhoo for sailfish, we're generally trolling at anywhere from four to eight knots as an average. If you're fishing rigged natural baits, a little bit on the slower side. If you're fishing all artificial lures, eight knots, sometimes even nine or 10 knots if you're targeting tunas. With Wahoo, when we're high speed trolling, you're at 15 to 20 knots. Okay, you are really booking, you're moving fast. Okay, you're covering a lot of ground. Um, and again, you're eliminating that bycatch and you're still gonna get some bycatch. What is the number one, or let me rephrase this. When you are high speed trolling for Wahoo, other than Wahoo, what is the most prevalent fish you're gonna catch? This wonderful young lady right here just hit the nail on the head and she went barracuda. Okay. <laughs> I know how she knows that. <laughs> barracuda, okay, that's right. <laughs> so again, you know, we're trying to avoid that and we'll talk a little bit more about how to do that. It's a really exceptional tactic, a lot of benefits. There are some downsides to it. One of those downsides to high speed trolling, fuel. Absolutely. I've got a 39 CV with triple 350 Verados. My boat, when I am high speed trolling for Wahoo at 16 to 18 knots, is burning more fuel than when I'm running at 45 miles an hour. Okay, think about that for a second. I'm burning more fuel at 16, 17 knots than when I'm running at 45. Why is that? Because there's more boat in the water. Okay, the boat is squatting. There's mo more boat in the water. So prepare to burn some fuel. And of course, every boat is different. You know, every configuration is different, but do not think that this is an economical way to fish because it is not, okay, by any means. As far as speed and narrowing down the ideal trolling speed, even though we talked about high speed trolling being anywhere from you know, 14 to 18 knots, 15 to 20 knots on the high end, the ideal speed is gonna depend. It's gonna vary based on a number of different factors. First and foremost, your boat. Everybody's boat is different. So that's gonna play a factor. Number two, the sea conditions. Of course, the calmer it is, the faster you can high speed troll. The rougher it is, try high speed trolling at 20 knots and three to fives, okay? Yeah, it's, what'd you say, it's fun? 
that's what you call fun. <laughs> yeah. So again, the conditions are also going to dictate how fast you're going to be trolling. But don't think that you're going to be going too fast because like we talked about earlier, you can't. Also, are you going up C or down C into the current or with you know the current pushing you? That's going to play a big role in how fast you're trolling as well. Don't be under the impression that high speed trolling is just setting your throttles or your you know speedometer to a certain speed and kind of setting it and forgetting and then just leaving it at that speed because that is absolutely not the case. As you make adjustments in direction, as you make adjustments based on weather and sea conditions, okay, and what direction you're running your boat in, you're, you're going to have to make adjustments on that throttle as well to make sure that you're maintaining that optimal speed. Also keep in mind, different style boats, inboard boats versus outboard boats, all leave a different trail, a different, you know, the white water behind the boat, the clean trolling paths behind the boat. So you'll have to find the optimal speed based on that as well. So there's a lot of different factors to consider. And one quick tip when it comes to speed and when it comes to, you know, ideal trolling speed, so to speak, is think about what direction you're trolling in. And just kind of follow me for a second. If I'm in Bimini, who's been to Bimini before? In the Bahamas, okay. So you guys know if you're standing in front of Bimini, I'm in Bimini Sands or I'm in the harbor coming into Bimini, I'm looking west, right? Okay, everybody's following me, I'm looking west. Now you control up and down that whole area right there from north all the way down the gun and even further and troll south, okay? On the other hand, as you go up around Bimini to Isaacs, the bank now goes east and west, right? Everybody follow me there? So it's almost like a big 90 degree turn. If the wind is from the west or from the east, if it's coming from either of these two directions, you're going to be much more comfortable fishing this side because it's much easier to high speed troll when you have the C to your beam than when you're going right into it. Everybody kind of follow what I'm saying? On the other hand, if you have wind from the north or from the south in this direction, you're going to want to be up around the edge, okay, from anywhere from Isaacs to the gingerbread grounds fishing beam to east and west, okay? So just keep that in mind. Here, we don't have that option, do we? No, because here along South Florida, you're going north and south, that's it. You're not going east and west. You might zigzag a little bit, but you're going north and south. So we'll start by talking a little bit more about the differences of trolling here versus trolling over in the islands, and then we're gonna get into the tackle, how we rig, the lures, hooking fish, landing fish, so on and so forth. So here in South Florida, and when I say here, Boca Inlet, Hillsboro Inlet, you know, our area, our neck of the woods right here, prime wahoo fishing is usually July, August, September. Okay, not that you can't catch them year round because 365 days a year, you can go out here and catch a wahoo or multiple wahoo. But the prime time is July, August, September. Anybody know why? Okay, the full moon. But during July, August, and September, the moon is the closest to us right here, and it increases water flow. And successful wahoo fishing is all about water flow. Remember that, all about water flow. And we're going to get deeper into that in a couple of minutes. So even though you can catch fish here year round, July, August, and September around the full moon, is when you're going to really have some solid wahoo fishing. Approaching the full moon and on the backside of the full moon. However, I always tell people this. They say to me, you know, well, you know, I was going to go wahoo fishing tomorrow. The conditions are perfect, but it's not a full moon, so I'm not going to go. <laughs> what? Okay, are, you, are you kidding me? Go. Who cares what the moon is doing? When you can go fishing, go fishing, okay? I mean, are you kidding me? Unless you have the opportunity to fish, you know, seven days a week, which not all of us do, okay? Go when you can go. Make a mental note of the conditions. Pay attention to what's going on, but don't let the moon dictate to you, 
you know, what you're doing. The tide. What is the best tide? Anybody know? Outgoing. Why? Let's think about that. Because as that water is flushing out of inlets and flushing off the shallower edges here, it's almost like a conveyor belt that is just bringing food to the Wahoo that are patrolling up and down the coastline. So outgoing tide. What's that? What part is the outgoing? I mean, earlier, later, or any other? You know what? As long as that water is flowing off, his question is, what part of the outgoing? Remember this, when the outgoing tide just starts, okay, it's not as strong as it is once you're in halfway through the outgoing tide. You have more water velocity being pulled off the edge. But there's more to successful wahoo fishing than just the tide. And let me explain what I mean. Outgoing tide is absolutely ideal. That is what you want doesn't mean wahoo are not going to be caught on the incoming tide because they will they're fish and they have to eat and if the correct opportunity presents itself they will feed okay but ideally speaking the outgoing tide is always going to be better however wahoo prefer low light conditions very much like tuna, tuna. thank you very much like tuna which by the way wahoo are not in the tuna family wahoo are in the mackerel family Wahoo are related to king mackerel and Spanish mackerel, not yellowfin tuna and blackfin tuna. Uh, but again, they are caught on both tides, outgoing tide being ideal. Low light conditions. So what does that mean? When do you want to start wahoo fishing? Early. Early, you know, early bird gets the worm, baby. There's no doubt about that when it comes to wahoo fishing. Early bird gets the worm, and usually for about two hours after the sun rises, by 10 a.m., that wahoo bite's over. It's over. Not to say that you're not going to catch one 12 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, sun's up, you know, bright as heck, and some Guggen is out there pulling who knows what and catches a 70-pounder. What, is that him? Did he do that? That's you? Nice job to the Googans, right? <laughs> 80 pounds, okay. All right. West Palm, okay. Cloudy days, absolutely. You will find that they will bite longer because it's hazy, it's cloudy in lower light conditions. They're sensitive to light. So you definitely want to get an early start if you can or fish later in the afternoon. So it's always a good idea when you go high speed wahoo fishing to have a plan B because you're not high speed wahoo fishing all day long. Okay, unless you got deep pockets as well, because that's a lot of fuel. So usually what we like to do is high speed wahoo fish in the morning. And then, like I said, by 9, 10 o'clock, forget it, it's over. Not only because it's so much brighter out and the fish tend to go deeper in the water column, but what other problem do we have by 9 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning? All the boats, all the Googans. Okay. <laughs> okay. They're just zigzagging everywhere, and it's not only fishermen. It's divers, it's snorkelers, it's sailboaters. Nowadays, you know, you go out here on a Saturday on a nice day, there's guys out there fishing on wave runners. Okay. There's guys out there paddling kayaks. Oh, forget the kayak guys. Okay. That's a different animal altogether. Sorry, Micah, but that's a different animal. Okay, so there's so much traffic out there that really by 9, 10 o'clock, it's over. So if you're really serious about high-speed wahoo trolling, make sure that you're willing to get up early. Don't be afraid to put baits in the water while it's still dark. Okay, while it is still dark outside. Don't say to yourself, oh, shit, it's 6 o'clock, it's still dark. No, put them out. Get them out there. What do you think, these fish can't see in, at night? Are you kidding me? Of course they could see at night, you know? So don't be afraid to set your spread while it's still dark out, okay? Um, if you can, you know, well, well, let me back up one second. So his question was on that tide. Remember this, though. We're saying two different things. Wahoo like low light conditions. Wahoo like an outgoing tide. So if, the con if you've got the tide, but the tide is at, you know, the wrong time of the day, do you say I'm not going to go wahoo fishing early in the morning because it's incoming tide? You know, again, you always, you try and have multiple facets working in your favor, but don't let that judge 
when you're going to go. You go whenever you can go. But again, make a mental note of that, okay? Because I don't care what the conditions are like. I guarantee everybody in this room can say that they've caught a quality fish or more than one when they least expected it, okay? Or on the flip side, when conditions were ideal and you thought you were going to crush them. Man, I thought I was going to crush the dolphin today. How many did you catch? Two schoolies this big. Okay, and you were like thinking about keeping that one. Okay, so yeah. Well, if I had to pick one, it's always going to be time of day. You know, I'm never going to say, well, the tide is right. I'm going to go at 11 in the morning and start high speed trolling. No, 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 no. Okay, so it's always going to be the time of day. And if the tide falls appropriately during that time of day, and if the moon is full, Woo! That bike could be on fire. And then you go out there, though, but then you got green water, and you don't catch anything. Okay? That, I mean, that could ha that's what happens. That's, it's fishing. That's why the guys that are the most successful Wahoo fishermen put in the time. Put in the time, and if they don't succeed on the first try, they don't give up. They keep going over and over and over until they you know, achieve success. So be willing to put in the time. So we talked a little bit about our coast, the depth. The ideal Wahoo depth here is, if I have to pick one number, anybody? 150. 150. We've caught them as shallow as 80 foot and as deep as, you know, we've caught them way offshore when you're dolphin fishing. But, you know, usually that 80 to 380 is the right avenue, we'll call it. But 150 to 180, if you only had to pick one depth, it would be that 150 to 180. Okay, up and down the coast. Zigzag a little bit, going up and down, up and down. You know, run up, get, go out the inlet here, point the bow north. If you had a choice of going south or north, whenever I have that choice to make when I'm high speed wahoo fishing, I always go north. I, ne I, don't, I don't like fishing off Fort Lauderdale. The freighters, the charter boats guys, guys down there think that they own the ocean. Okay, what's that? <clears throat> so I always go north, okay, because once, you know, you've got some really good conditions, so you've got structure here in our area, you've got two inlets that are five miles apart that are flushing bait out of those inlets, so I always go north, I zigzag from 150 to 180, sometimes out to 200, you know, you meander in a little bit, you meander off a little bit, not sharp zigzags, just S pattern, you know, a loose S pattern, okay? However, sometimes I'll troll 10, 15 miles north, turn around and troll 10, 15 miles back south. However, there's other occasions where I'll go out Hillsborough Inlet and if the conditions are right and the water's clean and everything looks good between Hillsborough and Boca Inlet, I'll troll that five mile stretch for three hours back and forth like this. Because I know it's just a matter of time. I know the fish are there. There's bait there. I can read them on my machine. Okay, you see the little, if, I don't know what kind of, you know, everybody has different sounders and different machines. On my Furuno, little black fins, the bullets, the skippies, the bonitas are little squares. You can read them lined up. They're stacked up. Okay, if I see the bait there, the conditions are right, you know, the stage is set for a Wahoo to feed. Okay, it's set. So if I'm really convinced, I'll just keep pounding that area over and over and over. However, if it doesn't look good, I'll keep going. And I'll go all the way on up to Boynton, you know, and then turn around and come back. Um, and again, by 9, 10 o'clock, then the bite's over. But 150, 180, we talked about the depth. You know, we talked about wind. And that's pretty much what our Wahoo fishery is like down here, our high-speed Wahoo fishery. A couple other tidbits, and this applies in the Bahamas and locally. When you hook a Wahoo here locally, Okay, turn the boat because you're never stopping the boat. The boat never stops. Turn the boat east and head offshore. Why? Who said it? Sharks. All of the sharks tend to hang out on the shallower reefs. Okay, and if you leave that Wahoo in the water long enough and there's a big bull shark in the area, you just paid your taxes for the year. Okay, that ever happened to anybody? Okay, you ever lose a fish to a shark? Okay, 
if you haven't lost a fish to a shark, you're a freshwater fisherman and <laughs> you haven't fished offshore, okay? Because I'm telling you, it, there's a lot of sharks out. If you really knew what swam out here, I tell people that all the time. They're like, I wanna go swimming, I wanna go to the beach. I'm like, do you know what lives out there? Do you have any idea what lives out there? Okay, if you knew what lived out there, if you knew, I just saw a video of a, I swear to God, this thing had to have been a thousand pound hammerhead shark inside Hillsborough Inlet. Whoa. Inside, Whoa. not on the outside. You know where everybody anchors up and swims? They're up there in the tower, filming, filming this enormous hammerhead. And I'm not saying you're gonna get eaten by a hammerhead. That's not tonight's sem you know, seminar. But <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm not swimming out there because there's a lot of sharks. So turn the boat east and drag that fish into deeper water, okay? Bahamas, let's talk about that, okay? Really, really a completely different high-speed wahoo fishery than we have here. If I went out here tomorrow morning and went high-speed trolling and caught one wahoo, I would feel like a king. I did it, success, great. I catch two, man, I am super stoked. Absolutely super stoked. Three, who are playing the lottery? Okay, playing the lottery, because today's my day, baby. That's not what the fishery's like over in the Bahamas, okay? It's a whole different animal. Why? Let's think about this. Why is the Wahoo fishing so much better in the Bahamas? Remember what I said earlier, successful Wahoo fishing is all about water flow, okay? Here, during the outgoing tide, you've got water pouring out of a couple of inlets. You have shallow, you know, relatively shallow water for about a mile, and then it drops off into deeper water. Now think about the Bahamas. Think about West End and Grand Bahama. Who's been, by show of hands, Grand Bahama Island, West End, okay? So you all know, and you can visualize this, or you can take your phone and Google Maps and look at, you know, West End and Grand Bahama Island. And the same thing, you will see that there is a huge bank, okay, a huge shallow bank. So on the outgoing tide, there is so much water flowing off of that bank. And the drop off right there in the Bahamas is drastic. Ooh, that was almost another one. The, the drop off is drastic. When I say drastic, you could be right here and it's 100 feet, 300 feet. Okay, I mean, it literally just drops. So you've got all of this water for miles and miles and miles just pouring off the bank on an outgoing tide, and then you've got this sharp drop off. Talk about an ideal scenario for a predator like a Wahoo. What do you think they're doing? They're not dumb. They're cruising up and down that edge, just waiting. Just, you know, it's like a buffet line coming to them, you know, eating whatever they can. So number one, you've got far greater, far more optimal conditions for this particular species over in the islands, especially up around West End. Same with Bimini, you've got a lot of shallow water and shallow banks, but even more so up, up there in Grand Bahama Island. Now keep in mind, if you can picture this, Grand Bahama Island runs east to west, okay? When you're at West End, if you came out of Old Bahama Bay or Blue Marlin Cove, wherever you were staying there, and said, okay, do I make, because you're now facing south, do I make a right and go up this way, or do I make a left and go toward Lucaya and fish that way? Always make a right, okay? Why? Because again, that entire island, it, it almost acts like a barrier and prevents all of that water from flowing off the bank to the south but it's all open on the west side. So all the water is flushing out on the west side. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so always come around, and I don't wanna say that there's never successful, you know, or good days toward Lucaya, and so, of course there are, of course there are. But as a rule, you wanna go around and go up the west side right there. There's areas called White Sands, Manila, okay, that are easily marked and there's also landmarks. There's like a, you know, when I say landmarks, there's not a big sign that says fish here, but there's a little exposed bar, okay? And you can fish up and down that entire edge, you know, anywhere from really the ideal zone is like eight to 10 miles to 30 to 35 miles. So that 25 mile stretch 
is really ideal. That's where most of the tournament guys fish, most of the locals, etc. Depth there also generally 180, a little bit deeper is the ideal depth, but you could go a little bit deeper out to 300, but don't go much shallower because when you get inside a 150, where is it? This is what's going to be left of your lure, a hook, okay, just a hook. Okay, the barracudas will absolutely destroy you. Plus, not only do they destroy your tackle, what's happening when you're hooking barracudas? You're not wahoo fishing, okay? You're wasting time, you're losing time, valuable time. You're not wahoo fishing. So they're a nuisance, and even though they make great deep drop bait, you only need one, okay, not 30. So try not to go too shallow. However, remember that drop off is so steep that it's easy to be in you know, 180 to 380, literally in 100 feet. Okay, so pay attention to your sounder. Pay attention to your chart plotter. Have an understanding of what is going on below the boat at all times and what's going on around you. You know, and I like to say too, high-speed wahoo fishing is not a one-man game. Okay, can you go wahoo fishing alone? Absolutely. I, for, I was on a stretch for a while where I just get up in the morning, bright and early, go wahoo fishing, two rods, Yozuri Bonita off of each rod, off the corners, and just troll. I'd fish for two hours, come home, have coffee, take a shower, go to work. Okay, very easy to do. I'm not dealing with trolling leads, shock cords, and all of that stuff. And you know, so there are ways certainly to wahoo fish alone, but not high-speed wahoo trolling. Okay, it requires a really a synchronized team effort. If you've got three guys, three guys working together can really fish properly. Okay, anything less than three, and it can become troublesome, and I'll explain why as we get into setting the spread. So same in the Bahamas, the outgoing tide is going to be ideal, low light conditions being ideal. Middle of the day, great thing to do, take a break from high speed wahoo trolling, go back to the resort, jump in the pool, or of course if you're 20, 30 miles away from wherever it is that you're staying, may it be Old Bahama Bay, which is absolutely beautiful, Blue Marlin Cove, which is a little cozier and also really nice, um, you know, wherever you're staying. You could certainly go back there to take a break or go deep dropping for a while, go bottom fishing. You know, everybody knows there's a, there's a, a synergy between high speed wahoo trolling and deep dropping. You know, it gives you a, a chance to take a break, to unwind from, you know, everything involved with high speed wahoo trolling and do some deep dropping for some queen snappers and silkies and stuff like that. You can wahoo fish on the incoming tide as well. There have been plenty of tournaments that have been won from fish caught on the incoming tide. Okay, it's gonna happen. Like I said earlier, fish feed. They don't just turn off completely. But if we set that stage, it would be the low light conditions and the outgoing tide. The size of the fish. Here locally, we tend to see wahoo in the 15 to 40 pound range. Anything above 40 pounds is a big wahoo locally, 40 to 80 pounds, you know, or is the bigger fish. There have certainly been wahoo 80, you know, what did you say, Palm Beach 80 pounds, somebody, okay, and even larger ones caught locally, so you never know when you're going to hook that beast. Over in the Bahamas, they just boated a fish that was 166 pounds. That's not much smaller than me. Okay, I mean, 166 pounds. That's a big ass wahoo. All right, I'm sorry, but that's a big fish of any species. And for a wahoo, I mean, that thing is eating 30 pound yellowfin tunas, you know, for breakfast. That's an enormous fish, 166 pounds. Ron, yours was big at 128, but you can go home now. Yeah, you're done. You know, that, you know that's the problem with being on top. There's only one way to go, you know? <laughs> so, anyhow. I bring this up because when we start to talk about tackle here, you need to start, you know, you need to start having that mindset that you're targeting a fish that could reach that triple digit mark or easily surpass it. We're not talking about going, you know, kingfishing or whatever. And not to say that they don't get big too. 
You know, I think there was just a 100-pound kingfish caught in Fort Lauderdale. Okay, what a slob that thing is. How big was it? Oh, my God. How disgusting would that taste? But <laughs> anyhow, not even in this. I'd put it in the smoker, and then I'd eat the smoker, right? <laughs> anyhow, you know, but again, this is a different animal altogether. This is a, a predator, a pelagic monster, okay? And I'm not going to classify kingfish and wahoo in the same league, even though they are related to each other. So additionally, the way that we're targeting these fish, okay, with the high-speed setup, you need some beefy tackle. This is no place, no place for cheap swivels. It's no place for cheap line. Okay, don't go to Kmart and there's a little blue light special, you know, on that bright blue colored line. You know, go, oh, it's only $1.99 for the big spool. Let me grab it. Are you kidding? Uh, really? Okay. So stick with quality gear. I always say buy the best gear that you could afford and then spend even more money and get even better stuff, okay, without your wife knowing or whatever. Okay. Make sure that you get the best gear that you can. Also, Double check everything, okay? Double check your drag system on your reel. Double check the guides, the roller guides, if you're using them on your rod to make sure that they're rolling smoothly. You know, double check every connection. Double check your swivels, everything, because all it takes is one mistake. And you know what? I've lost, I can't tell you, I don't want to say a ton of Wahoo, but I've lost my fair share due to reasons that I would have never thought. I lost a nice fish one day because my crimp rusted and opened up because I hadn't changed that crimp or re-rigged that lure in quite some time. And I kicked myself in the butt and said, oh, you know what, I deserve to lose that fish. I should have been on top of that. Another scenario I had, I was trolling a lure and the back hook ripped right out of the lure. Okay, out of, I'm not gonna tell you what lure yours are, Benita. Um, and literally the hook, ripped right out. And I'm not saying it was any fault of theirs. It wasn't. I mean, it's fishing. This stuff happens, right? Okay, it happens. There, it's not a perfect world. And that hook ripped right out of the lure. Okay, so different things happen. But again, double check everything. Mike, do you like mono or braid? Mono, okay, is your answer. So before we get into the rod to reel and so on and so forth, we will. Let's start talking about the line. You have three options when you are high-speed wahoo fishing. You have monofilament. This is 80-pound diamond line from Mamoy, high-vis, okay? You have braid, and then you have cable. Now, let me tell you something. Cable line is still in use today. Some of the tournament pros, guys, some of the best wahoo fishermen out there are still using wire line, okay? It's single-strand wire line. The problem with it is it's expensive, it's heavy, it's not easy to fish. If you get tangled, it could be a nightmare, but it can still be very, very effective. Braid has a lot of advantages. Braid is really thin. We all know that as compared to monofilament. You can pack a ton of line on the reel, okay? It has very, very little to no stretch at all, so there are big benefits to braid also. Monofilament is the most affordable option, the most versatile option, okay? Comes in a ton of different classes, colors, so on and so forth. And in my opinion, when high-speed wahoo fishing, I prefer the mono for the shock absorbing, you know, factor. In other words, mono stretches. Anybody know how far, if I had a 100-foot piece of monofilament, 100 feet, and if I pulled it from both ends like a tug of war, how far would that 100 foot piece of monofilament stretch before it broke? 30, 30, 30, 30. Correct, approximately 30%, approximately one third of its length in stretch. It's like a giant rubber band, like this, and then it'll pop right back into place. So it's very forgiving, okay, it's very forgiving. That's number one. Number two, it's affordable. Why is that important? You know. Now, you guys got this dialed in, okay? You're 100% right, because it's easy to, to make sure that you're always fishing fresh line, 
Okay, it's easy and it's affordable. Whereas if you looked at your reel and said, man, I got to dump 300 bucks on, you know, loading that thing with braid, you may be hesitant to do it. But you don't know that within 200 feet of the tip, that braid is damaged. You don't see it because those little fibers are so small. And then you hook that 167 pound Wahoo, okay, <laughs> to make the other guys look even smaller. And what happens? Pre Premature tackle failure, okay? That's what we call it. Zing pow, exactly. You're gonna lose everything. So monofilament, especially if you're gonna run over to the Bahamas, trust me, this is the cheapest, you know, this is the least of your worries when it comes to money, is making sure that your reels have fresh line. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Between the fuel to run over there, you know, West End is 65 miles, you know, depending on where you're running from. Bimini, 50 plus miles, okay, one way. Then, of course, all of the fuel you're going to burn while you're Wahoo fishing, checking in, you know, there's 300 bucks, okay? Liquor alone, forget that, okay? So there's another 300, and that's if you bring your own, okay? So in turn, you're spending money, you know, spending 20 bucks on some monofilament is the least of your concerns. As far as the color of the line, high vis just makes it very easy to see, very easy to track your lines behind the boat. So again, for our particular, or my opinion, what works best for us is the monofilament. 80 pound test, we don't fish anything lighter than 80 pound test. Why? Because we're pulling weights that are sometimes four pounds. Okay, so just think about the amount of tension that's on this outfit. And then you get a lure dragging behind it. You're pulling it at upwards of 20 miles an hour behind the boat and a 50 to 80 pound fish then comes in at 60 miles an hour and crushes it. Think about all of that tension at that one moment. One weak link, one little weak link and adios amigos, okay? It's gonna happen, I'm telling you. It's gonna fail. Wahoo will exploit your tackle like no other fish when it comes to high speed Wahoo trolling. The only fish that's better at embarrassing you is swordfish, okay, during the day. Oh yeah, yeah. But putting that aside, so again, 80 pound fresh line. The rods, we fished the Chaos Rodzilla. Such a cool name, isn't it? The Rodzilla. I don't know who came up with that, but I love it. It's rated for 60 to 130 pound line. It's on an aluminum bent butt. Okay, you can fish straight butt rods, but bent butt rods provide a little bit of a better angle to keep that lure tracking more parallel to the surface and a little bit lower in the water column. Ideal reel, a 50 wide, could be a Shimano, a Pen, whatever your favorite is. You know, this is a new Maxell two speed that we're playing with. Two speed, certainly important. Okay, really important when you're high speed Wahoo fishing to be able to pop that baby into low gear and just crank or your arm will fall off after the first fish. Okay, and those of you that have experienced that know exactly what I'm talking about. Because remember, that boat is moving the entire time, even when you're reeling that fish in. The bent butt also, this rod stays in the rod holder from beginning to end. Okay, you are not taking the rod out of the rod holder and thinking you're this macho guy, okay, and you're gonna put the rod under your arm and reel that wahoo in. No, you're not. Okay, it's gonna be in a rod holder and you're gonna straddle the gunnel or you know, just sit there and crank, whatever it is. So this is your typical manual outfit for high speed wahoo fishing. However, the latest trend is using the LP, the Lingren Pittman S1200, for high speed wahoo trolling with electric reels. Okay, now I think Marshall's gonna bring it down. And we're not talking one, we're talking four. Okay, so they will fish four. So between reels, line, rods, You've got $30,000 in four outfits, okay? <laughs> however, however, just think about the efficiency of having four LPs, okay? Where, you know, you could just go reel it in, reel it in, okay? Now, yes, I'm not saying it's as sporty as manually cranking. Of course it's not as sporty as manually cranking, but it's a lot of fun. Okay, I'm telling you, don't think that it isn't. Don't discount it because it's still a lot of fun, okay? However, 
Yeah, bring that bad boy over here. You know, electric reels, you know, somebody brought this up before. They're not permitted in Wahoo tournaments, but like I said, the, you know, the recreational guys have really fine-tuned high-speed Wahoo fishing to include the LP. Oh, my God. <laughs> Good. Now, no. <laughs> yeah. And again, this one, you're not even turning the handle. This one, you're just pushing the button. But it's an, this is, you know, literally the Mac Daddy of all electric reels on the market is the Lingren Pittman S1200. They also make a 24 volt version right now. I'm not saying you've got to fish four of these, but you can incorporate one of them if you do have one as your long bait. Okay, it just makes it a little bit easy. Well, makes it a lot easier. Okay, not a little bit easier. It makes it a lot easier. Okay, even if you're just checking your lure, you know, or you want to switch lures, you know, it really makes it a lot easier. Or what are you guys going to come grab this for me, or am I just going to, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> got it. There you go. It was a little heavy. All right. Thank you. So again, the electric reels are an option, okay? And they are starting to be used more and more. And I know when I said that, and I said, you know, four outfits, $30,000, and everybody's like, oh my God, it's a lot of money. And that's not a lot of money when you've got a $700,000 boat, you know? Everything's relative. It really is. And you know what? I'm, one guy's got one, and different guy's got one, and they all get together, and you know, that's what they're doing. So just something to, you know, talk about. But again, the manual way certainly is much more sporty. So from our outfit, we've got our 80-pound mono. We happen to have a wind-on leader on this reel. It is not something that is necessary, but I use these same outfits at night for nighttime sword fishing. And I have found that the wind-on leader, it's only a 25-foot wind-on leader, does not affect the performance or effectiveness of this outfit when you're high-speed wahoo trolling. From there, a 300-pound diamond fishing products ball bearing snap swivel, 300-pound rated for 300-pound. Does that mean I'm going to catch a 300-pound fish on this? No. But if you've got a weak swivel, I mean it'd be nice to catch 300-pound fish on this. But you know, if you have a weak swivel, it's going to fail. It's going to fail. So from your swivel, the next thing in the equation, the next part of the equation is your trolling lead. Now keep in mind, typically, this is what we consider a trolling lead. Okay, it's just a lead weight, kind of bullet shaped, egg shaped. This is traditionally what has been used for, you know, ever since the beginning of high speed wahoo fishing. It has some cable on both ends. Why? Right, because this thing racing through the water looks like what? Looks like breakfast, looks like lunch. I mean, it looks like a nice tasty snack flying through the water. So the Wahoo, excuse me one second. Yes, sir? Okay. So the Wahoos, you know, won't hesitate eating these. Okay, and you'll get cut off and there's nothing worse than getting cut off. Okay, because not only did you, you know, you just miss a fish, but he also took your $100 lure as well. Okay, and your weight and everything else. So, but traditionally, this has just been a typical lead Wahoo high speed trolling lead. However, when, just when you thought that they couldn't get any better, diamond fishing products refine the shape of the trolling lead. Okay, and that kind of resembles a submarine, doesn't it? And the government spent millions, probably hundreds of millions of dollars designing the perfect shape for submarines to be the most efficient that they possibly can be in the water column. So they refined the shape of the lead. This happens to be a 48 ounce sinker, three pounds, okay, three pounds, to be as efficient as possible, as hydrodynamic as possible. And what happens when you have the least amount of resistance on this trolling lead? It sinks deeper in the water column, right? And keep in mind, people tend to, th you know, I don't, well, I don't know what people tend to think sometimes, but don't be under the impression that as you are trolling at 16 to 18 knots, that this weight is 60 feet below the surface, <laughs> because it's not, 
okay, at all. It's a few feet below the surface, okay? So they refine the shape. And just when you thought, what could they do next? So then they created a stainless steel, okay? Now, what's the advantage of stainless steel? Couple things. Number one, everybody's like, ooh, ah. Oh, don't worry. It gets better, okay? So stainless steel, first of all, it's smoother than lead, which again, creates less resistance. It's gonna sink deeper in the water column. Number two, you can spin this and see how that's spinning? And just constantly spins, there's very, very little resistance. And what happens with, this, with the lead? Sometimes when you have the lead sinkers on the cable and as they're spinning through the water, the cable wears, wears the hole. And when the cable wears the hole, suddenly this is not spinning evenly, it's wobbling through the water column. Even very little, but that little bit of wobbling creates more resistance and brings the lure higher up in, you know, in the water column. So by using stainless steel, that never happens. So they refine the shape and they refined the material. They upgraded the cable because they don't want you to lose this $250 trolling lead. Okay? Now, just when you thought it couldn't get any better, okay, they powder coated them. Okay? Powder coated it. So now it's so stealthy, you know, and it's dark, or I like to fish mine white. Okay, four pounds, a four pound trolling lead, optimum shape, okay, stainless steel, optimum material. So again, you're gonna achieve the greatest success. Yeah, that's $250 trolling lead. I know that's crazy, but you know what? It's not crazy if you're pulling it off a $5,000 reel, right? Off a $700,000 boat, right? Okay, with $300 of liquor in the cooler. Then suddenly it's not so crazy, okay? <laughs> yeah. You know how much that fish is worth by pound when it's all said and done? Yeah, it's all relative. Listen, all I'm saying is that it's relative. And, and again, the guys that are real, you know, it's kind of like, listen, I'm an everyday guy like you guys. I, I really am, honestly. But there's other people out there that take it to a whole different level. You know what I'm saying? That are really extreme about it. They're, you know, really successful Wahoo tournament fishermen, and they're looking for the edge. The edge. What's that small little difference? What's that edge that can give me an advantage over the other 20 boats fishing this tournament? And I can win 50,000 bucks. So if $250 is gonna give me an edge, I'm gonna do it, okay? That's their philosophy, I'm gonna do it. So again, I'm not saying it's for everybody, I'm simply saying, that this is the next generation or the future of high-speed Wahoo trolling lights, okay? And by the way, there's a little alarm system on here, so at the end of the night, don't try walking through, you know, the door with them. So from there, you know, again, our snap swivel is connected to our trolling lead, right? Everybody with me so far? Next. From the back of the trolling lead, we attach a shock cord to the lure. That shock cord is monofilament or fluorocarbon shock cord, okay? It is not braid, and it's heavy. It's 200 or 250 pound test, okay? It can even be 300 pound test, but no less than 200 pound test. That's between the trolling lead and the lure. It's heavy monofilament because you're hand lining that fish so it's easy on your hands, for starters. Imagine if that was braid, and on one end you have a three or four pound lead, and then you've got a 60 pound wahoo flipping out on the other end, you, really dangerous stuff. So mono or fluorocarbon. How long that shot cord is makes a big difference. 25 feet, 25 feet is the ideal length. You want that lure and the lead to be running like this, in sync, behind a boat, like this, okay? If you have too long of a shock cord, what happens to the lure? It comes up here, okay? It's even higher in the water column. We don't want that. You want it parallel. You want it just like this. You want that lure to be as low as possible. Plus, 
the vast majority of Wahoo that are lost are lost right at the end of the fight when you're handlining them. So if you've got a long hand line, you know, a long shot cord, there's a much greater chance of losing that fish. So 25 feet is the ideal length between trolling lead and lure. Now let's talk about the lures. A lot of different options. I'm gonna talk about each one or just a, a handful of them, okay? Because there, of course there are many, there are, are as many productive Wahoo lures as there are people in this room here, if not more. If you're over in the islands, you know, the Bahamas, way out in the out islands, big lures, big lures, okay? The fish out there are big, like where they just caught that 160 something pounder, where Ron caught his 128. Big lures, nice and long, big bait. Remember that fish has to exert a tremendous amount of energy to chase that bait, to catch it. The reward has to be worth the effort. And that instant, because it's only going to take one instant, because you're trolling at 16 to 18 knots, the fish is going to see the lure come by, and in an instant, it's got to make a decision. Am I going to attack, or am I going to sit back? Which is it going to be? So if you're pulling a bait that's this big, is it worth attacking? No, it's like eating a french fry. I'm not going to walk two miles to eat a french fry. I'll walk two miles to eat a 20-ounce ribeye in hot sand barefoot. Okay, but I'm not going to do it, you know, for a french fry. So same logic. You've got to give them something that's worth eating. So over in the islands, you can fish much bigger lures. Okay. This one happens to be a Crooked Island candy from Black Bart. Oh, you could add another $175 to your setup. Okay. However, there's some much more affordable options that are equally as effective. This is a Chaos Special, a Captain Scott Special. Okay, that you can get right here. I don't know, what, what, it's, what do you guys charge for these? It's free, okay. <laughs> so anyhow, again, a big bait, okay, really important. Another really effective lure, especially over in the Bahamas, is the Ballyhood Cowbell. Ballyhood Cowbell. Can you guys hear that? Of course you can hear that. They can hear it across the street. Right now, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced because one of the selling points of this lure is this: is the noise. I am not convinced that when you're pulling this at 16 to 18 knots, that it's going like this. <laughs> okay. Now, of course, water is rushing through here, and there's certainly some activity. You know, some wobble. Does that noise affect? the bite. In other words, is the Wahoo eating this lure because of this? My answer to that is no. The Wahoo is eating this lure because regardless of the color, it looks like it's prey. It looks like the silhouette of a small bonita or a juvenile tuna, you know, big eyes, shiny head, flashy body. Okay, it's about the right size. It's moving through the water really fast. Okay, they eat it. So it seems to do really, really well over in the islands. The other advantage to the cowbell, one of the biggest advantages is, that's right, you can pull this with no trolling lead, okay? And that's a big advantage because the water flows through it, okay? Water flows right through it. So because you don't need a trolling lead, number one, you just save 250 bucks, but you can, you know, rig this right to the end of the line Okay. It's also a great shotgun bait, meaning my far out bait. The Ballyhood, Ballyhood Cowbell is a killer, especially over in the Bahamas. Excellent point, because it's just a mylar skirt, and when you purchase this, they give you spare parts. Not the spare head, but spare mylar, the body parts, and you can literally rewrap it in a second. Ne you know, I've never caught a single Wahoo locally on a Ballyhood cowbell, okay, ever. Another, they make three or four different sizes. That one, I want to say is the 32 ounce size, I believe it is, but I could be wrong on the number. That size, yeah. Yozuri Bonitas, okay, my absolute, one of my absolute favorite lures in dark colors, black, 
red, purple. Okay, Yozuri Bonita is a killer and has been the most effective high-speed Wahoo lure for me locally here. Okay, but also works really well in the Bahamas. If you can't get the color you're looking for, buy some black spray paint and spray paint it. Okay, I'm not kidding. Okay, or purple. Okay, no, I did many times. It used to be, I don't know what color it started as. Okay, um, great lure, absolute great lure. Cable. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the spread in a second. As soon as we're going to get done with the lures, okay, then we'll talk more about the spread. Another one that's an absolute staple, and this comes in many, many variations, and it's just basically an Islander-style head. This one happens to be from Canyon Gear. These are available in acrylic or in you know, a, a metal plated type of head, like the island lures that are up on that wall back there. I know that Scott has some available right there that he made especially for you guys for tonight. And then over the top, it just goes over a skirt, sometimes two skirts, and there's an egg sinker shoved up inside here. So it's got some weight, it's a large profile, okay? Purple and blacks, red and black, blue and white, Okay, sometimes all white. You know, I tend to believe that colors of trolling lures are important. But what's more important is that you're fishing it properly, at the right place, the right way. I'd rather be at the right depth, okay, fishing the right tide at the right stage, fishing a lure that's this color. Anybody ever see a bait fish that's that color? Okay, but they eat it versus having, you know, a lure that's perfectly mimics a natural prey species, but being out in 700 feet on an incoming tide at two in the afternoon, okay? So keep that in mind. It's more about where you are. Locally here too, I find that smaller lures are better here than they are in the Bahamas. This one is one of my favorites. It's been chewed up like crazy and I'm gonna keep fishing it. Okay, it keeps catching fish, so I'm going to keep fishing it. They sell these here too, I believe. I'm not even sure what brand this is. It's been in my tackle bag and in my arsenal for a long time. It's a little jet head, so water rushes in the head and comes out the back. It creates what we call a lot of smoke, a trail behind it, okay? And that's a killer, so a smaller lure that size. But, I mean, look at it. What does that look like? Little bonita or a little black fin tuna. It looks exactly like what they're eating out here. How many times do you go out here and not see these little bullets? That's what we call them, the little juvenile bonitas and the little juvenile black fins. They're everywhere out here, so it perfectly mimics the prey. So his, I'm sorry. Yes, so all of these lures I'm fishing with the trolling lead except the cowbell, okay? The cowbell I do not. Now let's talk about the spread and where to set the lures and how. Ideally speaking, as we mentioned earlier, if you've got three people on the boat, one guy at the wheel, because somebody's got to be at the wheel the entire time, the entire time. This is not snapper fishing, okay? You are high-speed wahoo trolling. You've got to be at the wheel. So you've got to have a wheel man and you've got to have a couple guys in the cockpit. Why do you need at least two people in the cockpit? Somebody's got to hand line the fish and somebody's got to gaff the fish, right? Okay, it can be really challenging to hand line a 60 pound Wahoo and gaff it by yourself. Not impossible, but challenging. And the guy at the wheel has to stay at the wheel because when you hook a fish, you're trolling at 14, 15, 16, 18 knots. You hook a fish, the reel just lights up. Just, I don't know if there's any better sound. Is there any better sound in the world than a reel screaming from a sick wahoo bite? I mean, th th there's no better sound. So suddenly you're trolling along, the reel blows up, scream in line, okay? You keep going because you want to double up. You want to catch another fish. Oftentimes where there's one wahoo, there are more wahoo. There, there could be more. They're not a schooling fish, but they will absolutely pack together, okay, because it's the perfect conditions are there. If there's one fish there feeding, it's not uncommon for there to be other fish. So if you hook a fish, 
don't run to the rod that has the fish on, because he's not going anywhere. Run to the rod that doesn't have a fish on. And do one of two things. Either pop it and free spool, with, and be careful, because if you pop it and free spool, okay, and you're doing 18 knots, and you're pulling a three pound lead, you're gonna have what we call a professional overrun, okay? A professional overrun. One second, okay, yes. So in turn, be careful when you're backing off on it. Point I'm making, back off, drop it back, five seconds, okay? Just drop it back, drop it back, drop it back, and then lock it back into gear. That's a great way to get a double hookup. Or crank, just start cranking, 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 and get that lure moving even faster. And that's a good way to get a double hookup. So don't run to the rod that has the fish on. It's not going anywhere. Run to the rods that don't have a fish on, okay? And try and hook up with a second fish. If a you know a few seconds goes by, five to ten seconds, and it hasn't happened, because already you're fighting that urge, right? Your hand is on that throttle, and you're fight you oh my god, you it's so hard for you to not pull back that throttle when that reel is screaming. Don't tell me it's not. I've got to be like, you know. It, it's so hard, but at some point, of course, you've got to do it. Then slowly pull back on the throttle. Do not come to a complete stop, okay? Keep that boat moving along at at least five knots, okay? At least five miles an hour, maybe even more. You want to keep that line tight because remember, what is happening? What is this doing? Sinking, okay, this is sinking and it's pulling that fish, you know, and it's creating an even larger hole in the fish's mouth. If you were in, in neutral, forget it, disaster. You're gonna lose every fish and you're gonna lose lures if you're too shallow as well and lose gear. So keep the boat, you know, moving while you're, while you're reeling that fish in. Keep that boat moving, no less than five to seven miles an hour, okay? The guy's at the wheel, you're cranking that fish in, you get all the way up to the trolling lead, somebody now grabs that shock cord, and now kind of follow me for a second. Here's our boat. That's the bow, that's the stern. I'm at the wheel. We've got a rod at this corner, starboard stern. We've got port stern, a rod at this corner. We hook the fish right here on this corner. Okay, does the rod ever come out of the rod holder? No. no. Also, let's not forget, the rod has a safety strap too. It could be you know, this sort of safety strap. It could be, I don't care if it's your shoelace, you better tie that rod to something. Okay, so the rod also, oftentimes, you, you, you don't have a lot of mobility with that rod. That's number one. So we hook the fish on this corner. One of the guys is reeling the fish in, the other guy grabs that leader. What direction am I gonna turn the boat? Okay, to the right, to the right. I'm going to turn it this way because he's bringing that fish up right here and that fish could, is coming right toward the motors. Okay, I promise you he's coming right toward the motors, okay? If I turn the boat this way, I'm literally going to have like a can of tuna, how it's all chopped up. That's what our Wahoo's going to look like, okay? And you don't want that gear wrapped up in your wheel in the Bahamas. Oh boy. You don't want that 35 miles away from wherever it is you're staying. So be very careful. Turn the bow in the same direction. In other words, if the fish is here, I'm going to turn the bow this way. I'm going to move the stern and the motors away from the fish. If I hook a fish on this corner and they're bringing them up, I'm going to turn the bow this way. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Yeah. If you got a double, then keep the boat going straight. <laughs> All right. <laughs> do whatever you got to do. What, you know, listen, absolutely, even if you hook two fish at one time, you're not getting them both to the boat at the same time, okay, because of how your, your spread is set. So getting back to it, rods and your spread, again, one of the most important parts of the equation, because if you get tangled, oh boy, sheesh, what a nightmare this could be, okay, if you get tangled with your high-speed Wahoo gear. So... You could essentially have a successful high-speed Wahoo trolling trip fishing one rod. Okay, you could because it only takes one bait in the water to catch a fish. So obviously you only need one, but ideally speaking, three. 
Okay, you could fish four if you've got the right guys on the boat and if the conditions are right and everybody's dialed in, you certainly can fish four. But three is really simple and really effective and it's just the ideal setup for high speed wahoo fishing. Rod number one, heaviest lead closest to the boat. Okay, heaviest lead closest to the boat. So if I'm fishing 48 ounces, as an example, okay, a three pound lead, 48 ounces, that's gonna be the closest to the boat. It is going to be approximately 100 to 150 feet behind the boat. As a round number, we'll say 150 feet, okay? So 150 feet behind the boat. If you are uncertain what 150 feet is before you leave the dock, grab your rod tip and pull out 150 feet and then mark the line with some nail polish or a black magic marker. And then take the reel and on the side of the reel, take either a piece of tape or can everybody see that? Okay, just a little piece of masking tape and it says 50. Now that's not indicating 50 feet for my Wahoo lure. This happens to be indicating that there's a loop in the line at 50 feet because again, it's also a nighttime swordfish outfit. However, like I said, if you're unsure what 150 feet is, pre-measure it in advance. Know that that rod is always going to be fished in that position. You're not mix, match, mix, mix matching rods. You've got three rods, three positions. Starboard corner, center, port corner. Okay, and that rod is always in that position. Heaviest lead closest to the boat. Next, medium sized lead. So if that one is 48, maybe I do a 32 ounce, 250 feet behind the boat, okay? and that's this corner. Then center, I've got my lightest lead or no lead at all. What do I have on the center? Bingo. And that one's 350 feet behind the boat. So I've got 150, 250, 350. Deep, not as deep, not as deep. And what that enables me to do is almost troll and figure eights and not get tangled, okay? Because you've got three different lures at three different lengths at three different depths. And as I make a sharp, and not that I'm making a 90 degree turn, because remember, when you're high speed trolling, you're just swerving nice and casually, right? You're not making sharp lefts and sharp rights and a sharp U-turn, okay? You're not doing that. So in turn, as you slowly swerve, those lines can go up and it could flow above and below each other, and you will not get tangled. It is a very simple spread, very simple. Okay, you, you, you got it. You're all experts right now. 150, 250, 350. Heaviest, medium, lightest. Okay, it's that simple. That's why the three rod spread is so effective and so easy for anybody to fish, as long as you understand that logic. Okay, now if you're only fishing two rods, you've got to decide which of the two do I want to fish? Do I want to fish the 48 and then one with no lead that's way back there? Do I want to fish, you know, the 48 and the 32? Again, that's up to you to decide, but we're talking about a three rod spread. Yes. Excellent question. With the Yozuri Bonita, that's an excellent lure for the shotgun with no lead, or you can put lead on it and fish it closer to the boat as well. So you can fish the Yozuri Bonita with or without a trolling lead. Okay, I'll get into questions in a minute. Okay, so in turn, we've got that three rod spread, very, very simple. Which rod am I going to deploy first? The long one. That's right. Okay, because I don't want anything, you know, to interfere. So I'm going to put the long one out first, then I'm going to do the medium one, then I'm going to do the short one. Make sure that you have a clear line of communication. If my buddy's with me on the boat right now and he's got no idea, no idea how I set the spread, and then it's his turn to set the spread, or I say, hey, grab that or let that out, and he has no clue. He's a great fisherman. Oh, are you a great fisherman? Oh, yeah. Eh, this is eh. Okay, you are. 
you're, we are a much better fisherman right now than you were when you got here, right? So in turn, make sure that you've got a clear line of communication with everybody on the boat. Everybody knows what their role is. Everybody knows who's reeling, who's not reeling. You know what I'm saying? Work together. High speed wahoo fishing is a team effort. When you hook one fish, obviously you're not reeling in your other lines unless you absolutely have to. Okay? If you don't have to, don't. Because you're moving continuously forward, it's rare that your wahoo is going to go that way, okay, in front of the boat and around the bow. Plus, remember, you've got a guy at the wheel, okay, who's constantly monitoring what is happening and maneuvering the boat accordingly. Especially in the Bahamas, you know, when you hook that fish, get him into deep water, which is another reason that the guys in the Bahamas are using the electric reels. Because if you leave that wahoo in the water too long, shark, okay? And anyone that's ever fished, especially cat, sand sal, out there, knows that the sharks are man-eaters, okay? Those things will eat a 100-pound wahoo in one bite, okay? So they incorporated the electric reels to help land some of these fish, you know, before they get sharked. Because what's the sense of going all the way there, hooking a fish and just reeling up ahead? Okay, that, that stinks. So we've talked about the differences between here and the Bahamas. You know, we've talked about Bimini and West End. Both of them are both productive. If I had to pick one, I would certainly say West End okay, over Bimini. But Bimini does have some good wahoo fishing as well. Remember that everything that we discussed tonight is just a general picture, but always be ready to adapt. Always be willing and capable and ready to adjust what you're doing based on the conditions. We talked about the ideal direction based on the sea conditions and how to decide am I going, am I trolling east and west or am I trolling north and south? You know, depending on that beam C, because it's much easier to high speed troll with the waves on the side of the boat than going into a head C. Double, triple check all of your connections, your drag. Do not sock down the drag. You want just enough drag on your reels so you don't have what we call line creep. Okay, anybody know what line creep is? Line keeps creeping off the reel. You don't even notice it. You turn around, you're like, oh, <laughs> okay. You know, has that ever, ever happened to anybody? Has that happened to me? You know, so in turn, you know, you've got to constantly adjust that drag based on the conditions. If you're going down sea, you're going to have more line creep than if you're going up sea, into a sea. So just keep that in mind that, again, it's not set it and forget it. There's a lot more to wahoo fishing. Colors we talked about, you know, like I said, all of the natural colors, the blacks, the purples, are all really good. I would say it's about shades. It's about contrast. It's always good to have some light color lures and some dark color lures, okay? It's about contrast and shade. Hooks, a lot of the high-speed wahoo lures can either be purchased or rigged with a single hook design or a two hook design. Different guys believe different things. And, and you know, sometimes with the two hook designs, if the hooks are 180 degrees apart from each other, in other words, one is facing up and one is facing down, oftentimes a wahoo will literally spit a lure that has two hooks because as it opens and closes its mouth, what's happening with those two hooks? It's literally wearing holes in the top and the bottom. So if you're going to fish a two hook rig, I would absolutely recommend that both hooks are facing the same direction. You guys understand what I'm saying? Okay. Doesn't mean that a single hook lure isn't gonna work because yes, it will. It only takes one hook, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So don't shy away from rigging lures or purchasing high-speed wahoo lures that just have a single hook. The cable on the lures, 250 or 275 pound multi-strand cable, okay? Six feet is plenty, six feet. You don't need to fish more than six feet, okay? But don't fish two feet 
because that fish coming in, charging in on the lure, will literally push that lure forward. And if that cable is not long enough, you have a chance of that fish literally cutting the leader. So we've pretty much touched on everything from beginning to end. Okay, we've talked a little bit about eating wahoo as well. Make sure you keep these fish on ice, obviously, as fresh as possible. Best way to eat them is sashimi. Almost every wahoo I've ever caught, and you guys will tell me this, have a parasite, have this bug, okay? It's this worm, okay? And it almost looks like a, like a leech, okay? And it's pretty gnarly looking at it because your fish has been dead for hours and the leech is still moving around as you're cleaning the fish. You know, it's like this little alien looking thing. It's absolutely common. It does not affect the fish. And you know what, if you want to throw away the Wahoo because it has that, call me. And I'll discard of it properly for you. I'll make sure that it's officially put away, you know. So, but don't, you know, don't get alarmed if it has that. Another great way to prepare Wahoo is take the, you know, the fillets themselves, cut out a chunk that's like the size of a scallop and wrap it in a piece of bacon, throw it on the grill. Okay, bacon wrapped Wahoo is absolutely delicious. Keep in mind though, Wahoo cooks very, very fast. Very fast, it cooks really fast and it's really easy to, to overcook it and to dry it out. So only cook it about, in my opinion, depending on the thickness and how you're preparing it, a few minutes at the most, and only till it's about 75% of the way done. Remember, you could eat it raw, okay? So only till it's about 75% of the way done, because by the time you serve it and sit down and you know have another cocktail or whatever and then eat it, then it's gonna be officially done, okay? So keep that in mind, don't overcook it. So with all of that being said, you know, hopefully you've got a little bit of a better picture on high-speed wahoo fishing. It's not rocket science, but it is a science, okay? But it's about the fundamentals. It's about the big picture and about thinking about what you're doing and how you're doing it and where you're doing it and when you're doing it. And all of those different pieces need to come together. And again, it's about those details, you know? And like I said at the beginning, one fish, can make a huge difference. And we've all lost fish due to errors. Anybody ever lose a fish because of a bad knot? Four, four people raised their hand. Uh, everyone else is disqualified from the raffle. Who's lost a fish due to a bad knot? Okay, thank you. Who's lost the fish because they went to gaff the fish and they did that wrong? You know, they, there's what we call premature tackle failure and then there's angler failure, okay? Tackle failure and angler failure. If you eliminate tackle failure and angler failure from the equation, you're gonna be a much more successful angler. 